So I just read this article from BuzzFeed with the headline, the pandemic has made summer body pressure even worse. And to that, I say, no way. I'm about to have an unapologetic fat boy summer. Summer body pressure? I just spent an entire year of my 30s stress eating through a once in a lifetime pandemic and a generation defining election. No. Granted, over the past few months, I've been taking better care of myself, working out more. I'm aiming for a better tomorrow, but it's gonna take time. And yeah, in the meantime, I'm built like a squishmallow, but that's perfect for squeezes and hugs. Yeah, give yourself the time and the grace, because a lot of us weren't thriving, we were just surviving. But with that said, welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show, your daily dive into the news. It is Tuesday, April 20th, 2021. Definitely hit that like button. Also, subscribe. One lucky subscriber for the month of April will be getting $5,000. But with that said, let's just jump into it. And the first thing that we're gonna talk about today was easily one of the most requested stories. It's in the world of online entertainment, business, charity, and that is the news around Mark Rober. Right, so for those that don't know, Mark Rober is one of the biggest YouTubers on the planet. Pretty much anything that he releases on his YouTube channel gets 20 to 100 million views. And a lot of his content is about cool science-y things, cool engineering stuff that also has a very interesting story with uh, a ton of people that have come to know him for his yearly glitter bomb videos where he essentially trolls people who steal packages from people's front doors. But his most recent video was different because he allowed people into his real life with a video titled The Truth About My Son. In the video, he shares that his son is autistic and he, and he says that he's normally very private about his life and, and his child because he wants to protect his son, but also saying that he wanted to share his son's story because he feels so lucky to have him. And in the video, he explains a little bit about what autism is. He introduces the stories of other people who also have autism and announced his fundraiser with Jimmy Kimmel, with that fundraiser being called Color the Spectrum and the proceeds going to a charity called Next for Autism. And essentially he's gonna be doing this massive live stream with a whole slew of stars on April 30th to raise money. With some of the celebrities participating being Mr. Beast, Jack Black, Charlie and Dixie D'Amelio, Andy Samberg, Paul Rudd, and more. And actually, so far, according to the fundraising tab on YouTube, just from the announcement video, the event has already made $858,000. And while the video itself on YouTube has received almost universal praise, with 1.6 million likes and only 8.4 thousand dislikes. But Mark is now facing a lot of backlash. A lot of it really seems to be centered around Twitter, with a lot of people speaking out about Next for Autism, saying they're not a worthy cause to give money to for multiple reasons. Some saying they don't like the charity's ties to Autism Speaks, which previously had curing autism and its mission statement, and many believe the group still tries to find cures. But most in the community don't see it as something that needs a cure. So people have been calling out Next for Autism because they believe that like Autism Speaks, they have funded that as well. Additionally, people have pointed out that Next is tied to the Center for Autism and the Developing Brain, which is researching and enhancing treatment options in their mission. That center has also been accused of trying to prevent autism, with many sharing this screenshot where prevention is in their mission statement, though it is worth noting it's not there now. Others are saying that Next for Autism supports a practice called Applied Behavioral Analysis, which is a therapy that targets and changes certain social skills that many have described as conversion therapy for people with autism. And finally, some just didn't like Mark's video about his son and the way that he painted autism. You also have a change.org petition getting some traction, with that petition aiming to stop the fundraiser saying that Next for Autism supports eugenics and other extremely harmful ideologies that all come down to the sole purpose of ending the existence of autism people and saying that no one involved in the organization or event are from the autistic community and there are better organizations that do more to help autistic people. And so far, it does appear that this vocal backlash has had an impact on the event. Are you the likes of Rhett and Link announcing that they were no longer participating in the event? But also for their part, we have seen Next for Autism putting out a statement saying there has been some outrageous misinformation circulating about Next for Autism, its mission, methods, and partners and saying our mission has never been the cure or prevention of autism. In fact, Next was created to fill a void, adding that at the time it was was formed, most groups were trying to fund biomedical research while Next was focused on school services. Also adding that their partnership with groups like Autism Speaks are to fulfill their mission of expanding access to programs and services. And adding, anyone using these partnerships to draw a line from Next to eugenics or anything related to the prevention and cure of autism is doing an enormous disservice to the people we serve by spreading this gross untruth. Also, regarding applied behavioral analysis, they said that the methodology has changed over the years and bears no resemblance to the conversion therapy-like treatments that people are claiming the group supports, noting that they're working on getting more representation in the group and are committed to including more autistic board members in the future. With Rober himself also tweeting last night, in my video I mentioned there is a services cliff after an autistic person graduates from high school. My son is almost there. Every last penny raised from color the spectrum will go towards helping that transition. The three buckets below are the extent of how the money will be used, and they are showing work, 
home, and social. Right, Rover there is seemingly trying to put people's minds at ease as far as what the money donated is actually going to go to, but essentially saying that the money isn't going towards an ABA program or, or curing people of autism. It's about helping people that are in high school transition to being an adult because the services drop off. And I mean, ultimately that is where we are right now. And as far as my opinion on this, I don't fully know right now. I, I will let you know I have a, a Mark Rober bias. From everything I've seen, he's an awesome good guy. Uh, you talk to anyone in the community, I, almost everyone will universally say that. And I watched this video and I think that Mark Rober is just trying to do something good here. And for me personally, when I watch that adorable ass video with his son, it, it doesn't come off in any way that he's saying, I need to cure my son, that we need to cure autism. With it seeming like, to me, like he's saying, I love my son as is, but I'm very concerned for, for people that may be in his position that, you know, they're not as fortunate as Mark Rober. We need to think about that transitionary type of period. Also, he's the kind of guy I would normally just give the benefit of the doubt that he's done his research into whatever he is touching. Meanwhile, I do want to be sensitive to people that are making claims against this charity, many saying that they are autistic themselves, while at the same time acknowledging that the charity has refuted claims, denied things. Personally, I'm just trying to use the situation as a, a way to kind of educate myself on the whole thing. I mean, I didn't even know there was a debate between is it okay to say autistic person or a person with autism and also what the people it's meant to describe want but yeah with that said based off of what we've seen so far i would love to know your thoughts and why you have those thoughts in the comments down below but from that i want to take a second to thank the fantastic sponsor of today's show Noom. If you've watched my podcast, you know that I've mentioned Noom a few times as a new and different way to lose weight. If that's what you're looking for, get healthy, achieve your goals using proven cognitive behavioral therapy tools and practices. Personally, I use Noom because I've been trying to develop healthier habits. And to be honest, I feel better about myself when I'm actually able to keep some sort of a schedule. And Noom feels different because it works by leveraging psychology and science to help people live healthier lives. Right? Strive for progress, not perfection. Basically, just do what works for you, which is the type of encouragement I find helpful as I work on my daily habits. With articles in real life coaches to support you, the program reminds me that making better choices takes practice and I just gotta keep practicing. Basically, it's the pep talks, motivation, support, and reminders that you need when life gets away from you. So if you wanna check it out, head on over to trynoom.com slash Phil and take Noom's 30 second quiz for free to create a custom program for you. And then let's talk about Tesla, right? So federal agencies are now investigating whether or not an autopilot feature is to blame for a deadly Tesla crash that happened over the weekend. And so what we know there is that incident happened around 11.30 Saturday night, just outside Houston. We had a model running off the road at a high speed, crashing into a tree, killing both men inside the car. And according to local authorities, no one was behind the wheel with one man reportedly in the rear of the car and the other in the front passenger seat. And alongside that, Constable Mark Herman noted that the fire caused by the crash took hours to put out. With a matting that normally would have taken a matter of minutes, but instead 30,000 gallons of water were needed. Right, so there it raised a concern about the batteries being used in electric cars, because while generally safe, they can also result in what is referred to as a thermal runaway, right, if the car crashes at a high speed. But uh, as far as the autopilot feature goes, According to testimony from the men's wives, just minutes before the crash, both men had been talking about going for a drive as well as the car's autopilot feature. So while it has not been 100% confirmed, there is a decent amount of evidence to suggest that they may have been using this feature at the time of the crash. But we've also seen a lot of people unconvinced, including one person who tweeted, this doesn't make sense. With that person then citing a number of the autopilot safety features, including that seats are quote, weighted to make sure there is a driver, hands must be on steering wheel every 10 seconds or it disengages, and that autopilot doesn't go over the speed limit. We also saw a Tesla CEO, Elon Elon Musk directly replying to that person, saying your research as a private individual is better than professionals. Data logs recovered so far show autopilot was not enabled and this car did not purchase full self-driving. Moreover, standard autopilot would require lane lines to turn on, which this street did not have. However, in replies to that comment, you had users sharing dozens of videos of people appearing to have autopilot activated without anyone in the driver's seat. Others claiming that autopilot can be enabled without lane markings and will go over the speed limit. One Duke researcher also citing her publication, which found that in 30% of trials, Tesla vehicles drove autonomously for nearly 30 seconds on extreme curves that lacked even a single lane marking. But no matter the online discourse that we're seeing, as of now, local authorities say that they plan to issue search warrants on the data, which should tell them whether or not autopilot was on. And as part of a federal response, both the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the National Transportation Safety Board have also said that they're sending out teams to investigate the crash. And very notably, this is all coming after the NHTSA said last month that it's investigating nearly two dozen Tesla crashes involving either confirmed or suspected use of autopilot. And as the Washington Post has also pointed out, this could be a sign that regulation is coming. The outlet noting that agency critics say regulations, especially of Tesla, are long overdue as the automated systems keep creeping toward being fully autonomous. And adding at issue is whether Musk has oversold the capability of his systems by using the name autopilot or 
telling customers that full self-driving will be available this year. There, as far as Tesla itself goes, it does warn drivers that they still need to pay attention and be ready to take control of their vehicle even when using autopilot. And then we should definitely talk about, I mean, it's the reason that today's show is late. We should talk about the murder trial of Derek Chauvin because the verdict has come in and the verdict from the jury was guilty on all counts. Guilty of second degree murder, third degree murder, and second degree manslaughter. And if I can insert two personal notes here, one, I'm so relieved, but also two, isn't it kind of ridiculous that we had to be this nervous? That we all saw what happened, but we had so much doubt that justice would actually be served? Also, with this story, we need to remember that it is not over yet. One, we still obviously have to wait to see the sentencing, and two, we should also mention following yesterday's closing arguments that Chauvin's lawyer, Eric Nelson, asked for a mistrial. With Nelson arguing that comments made by Representative Maxine Waters over the weekend where she said that protesters should, quote, stay on the street and, quote, get more confrontational, right, if Chauvin is acquitted, amounted to threats and intimidation against the jury. And while Judge Peter Cahill ultimately dismissed that request, saying that he didn't believe that her remarks would prejudice the jury, he also added, I'll give you that Congresswoman Waters may have given you something on appeal that may result in this whole trial being overturned. And immediately we saw a ton of Republicans seizing on this, condemning Waters and accusing her of inciting violence. This, including House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy, who said that he was introducing a resolution to censure Waters, which uh, in politics speak essentially means a public reprimand. But but just this afternoon, the House blocked that measure along party lines. Additionally, we've also seen numerous people defending Waters, claiming that she was not inciting violence. Like House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who said that she was talking about confrontation in the manner of the civil rights movement. With many others echoing that on Twitter, arguing that, in fact, by contrast, McCarthy himself spread Trump's false election claims that literally incited an insurrection. So I'm also taking aim directly at Judge Cahill, saying that he was undermining Waters' right to free speech. Also noting that while the judge ended each day warning the jury to not pay attention to the news, he also did didn't sequester them from the get-go. And finally, others arguing that her remarks are not at all grounds for appealing a case, with one user writing that if Waters' statement is used to overturn a guilty verdict for Chauvin, courts are gonna have to go back and revisit every single case where Donald Trump made a comment about pending trials for four years when he was in office. But ultimately, that is where we are with this story now. It's still a developing situation. We have to see, once again, what happens with the sentencing, what the, the public reaction is going to be, because uh, I'm filming this just as it was announced. So in the meantime, with this story, I'd love to know your thoughts, one, on the verdict we got today, and two, uh, what are your thoughts regarding the Maxine Waters situation? Then, we should definitely look to Florida, because yesterday, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis signed a law that he described as the strongest anti-rioting pro-law enforcement measure in the country. And so the law, which takes effect immediately, was written following the nationwide protests over the death of George Floyd. And among other things, it will increase penalties for protesters who block roadways or deface Confederate statues or other public monuments, mandate that anyone arrested at a protest be denied bail until their first court appearance, meaning many will likely have to stay overnight in jail. It also creates two entirely new crimes, one called aggravated rioting, which is a felony that carries 15 years in prison, and another called mob intimidation, which is a misdemeanor punished by up to a year. It also bumps up crimes or previously misdemeanors such as blocking the highway during a demonstration to felony charges. It cracks down on efforts to defund police departments by allowing local officials to appeal decisions to reduce police budgets to the governor's office. And finally, in one of the most notable provisions, it gives legal immunity to people who drive through protesters blocking a road. And so with all of that, you have DeSantis and other supporters of the new law arguing that it will protect Florida from the kind of unrest and destruction that occurred in certain places last summer, with the governor specifically saying that the state would be prepared for protests if Chauvin was acquitted. But you also have Democrats and civil rights groups condemning this policy, arguing that Florida experienced very little violence during the summer's demonstrations, which is something DeSantis even mentioned himself when signing the law, with those groups saying that the law is simply meant to intimidate people, claiming that it was intentionally signed the same day of closing arguments in the Chauvin trial to send a message, arguing that the new policy violates the First Amendment right to peacefully protest, right? And as Kara Gross, the legislative director at ACLU Florida, explained, the problem with this bill is that the language is so overbroad and vague that it captures anybody who is peacefully protesting at a protest that turns violent through no fault of their own. Those individuals who do not engage in any violent conduct under this bill can be arrested and charged with a third degree felony and face up to five years in prison and loss of voting rights. The whole point of this is to instill fear in Floridians. With others also arguing that the measure that will give immunity to people who drive through crowds may have protected the white nationalists who ran over protesters and killed a woman during the Charlottesville protest in 2017. And while yes, you do have Democrats and activist groups already saying that they're going to challenge this new law in court, it is currently in place and that is where we are now. And ultimately with this story and honestly anything else that stood out to you today, I'd love to know your thoughts in those comments down below because this is the end of today's show. As always, thank you for watching, liking, subscribing, all the good stuff. If you're looking for more to watch right now, I got you covered here with more news or maybe you want to catch my latest podcast, you can click or tap right there or in the top description. But with that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow.